multiple versions. My goal is to get through some of chapter five. So um, I was a little delinquent and I just totally forgot to print out notes for chapter five. So I copied those. I'll hand those out here in a little bit. So what we want to talk about is mole conversions. Um, and we're going to throw in some terms. So this is how I'll introduce these terms. I like to do it this way because um, most of you will understand what's going on when I'm trying to do it this way. So I have a bicycle factory. Now that's kind of a, I don't really have a bicycle factory. So let's pretend I have a bicycle factory. How would you make a bike from wheels and frames? Frame. Yeah. Two wheels and one frame, right? Unless it was a unicycle factory, and then I would do one wheel and one frame, right? But that's those are the stoichiometric coefficients. So I'll have two, two bike, uh, one frame, and two wheels, right? And that makes one bike. So that's my balanced equation. The one, the two, and the one, those are my stoichiometric coefficients. So this equation balanced in that sense. So that everything that's on the left shows up on the right. And I could do it with pictures, right? I could draw a little picture of a frame and wheels, but I'm not good at that anyways. I can barely write, so we'll stick with this. So then the question says, how many bikes can you make from 10 wheels or 10 frames and 14 wheels? Seven. Seven? How come you can't make 10? You don't have enough wheels, right? That makes sense, right? That's like, does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, we should say something. <laughs> but, but yeah, you're gonna run out of wheels because each frame, right, requires two wheels. You need how many wheels to get all that done? You need a total of 20, right? How are you doing that in your head? 14 divided by two, because it's two per, right? Mm -hmm. And then if I said, how many frames, how many wheels do you need for 10 frames? How are you doing it? multiplying by two because two wheels for every frame. Okay, so this is the way uh, the chemical calculations work. We have to do it in terms of ratios of the components. And so if I had, I'm gonna write it out so it looks like dimensional na analysis, but I have 10 frames. I have two wheels per frame. That means I would need 20 wheels, right? That's one thing that I can do. Uh, the other kind of ratios that you can use, you can say, well, if I have two wheels, oh, sorry, not two wheels, 14 wheels, then it's two wheels for every one frame or for every bike, let's do it for that, for every bike. And then I can produce seven bikes. So there's all kinds of calculations that you can do, and I want you to understand, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be for the frames to bike, you can just look at the ratios of wheels and frames. And it's all from this balanced equation. But, but you guys sort of intuitively understood that with, if I have one frame, I can make one bike, right? Right. So I could have made 10 bikes from 10 frames, but I could only make seven bikes from 14 wheels. You kind of understood that, right? And, but the mathematics of it is like this. So how do, we, how do you actually do the rest of that thinking in your head? Well, in your head, you said 10 frames. It's one bike for one frame. That's 10 bikes. And you knew in your head that you could only get to seven because at some point you're going to run out of wheels, right? Does that make sense? You knew in your head at some point. So it turns out that this has a name. This is known as the limiting reactant. And actually, to know, like here it's easy, but in chemistry, to know what the limiting reactant is, you have to calculate how much product each reactant could make for the quantities that you're given. So that's actually 
what I'm doing in the second half of this slide here, that part of the calculation that's below that line. I'm calculating to see how many I can make from the wheels and how many I can make from the frames. It's both calculating bikes, right? So this is my limiting reactant, and then seven bikes is my theoretical yield. That, in theory, how much I could make, provided that nothing went wrong. And just like in real, like making of bicycles, right? Chemistry, you don't always get all of it out. Like sometimes you open up a box when you're making a bike, and they left something out, and you can't actually make the bike. Uh, you guys remember we used to have bike tracks here? My son, my oldest son worked there. He was one of their bike mechanics. And every once in a while, you go to make a bike, and they didn't include all the parts, right? So that that's limits how much you can make. But theoretically, if you have 14 boxes of bikes, or seven, sorry, you know, 10 boxes of bikes, you could get 10 bikes out of it, but you didn't, it didn't always work that way. So this is some of what I wrote on that other slide already. The theoretical yield is the amount, is the, yeah, let me just write it as a sentence. The amount that could be produced from the limiting reactant. Now, how did I know which one was the limiting reactant? What did I do? <coughs> I used both of them to see how much they could both make. All right. Yeah, so to find the limiting reactant, I know where you're going. Right. Calculate the amount of product produced by each reactant. And the reactant that produces the smallest amount of product is the limiting reactant. <coughs> okay. Yeah, so to get the theoretical yield, the theoretical yield is how much is can be produced for the produced for the limiting reactant, but to know that you have to know which one's the limiting reactant. So how you find the limiting reactant is you take all the reactants you're given and figure out how much product it will make. Whichever produces the least is the limiting reactant. How much it produces is the theoretical yield. Okay. Can I see the process? I mean, with the bicycles, you kind of intuitively knew, I'll oh, divide that by two, and I can only get this many. But you, know, you, you can figure it out intuitively. So yeah, sorry. Now, I'm not going to define all these things again, but the excess reactant is the one that's left over. All right. So the reactant that uh, is left over, I'll explain that in a second, all right, um, is the excess reactant. For my bicycle factory, what was the ex excess reactant? The frames. What happened to the wheels? They all got used up. So one of the other things, the concepts that comes along with this is that the limiting reactant gets completely used up in the reaction. And when it gets completely used up, the reaction has to stop because there's no more of that component to make any more product. Okay. And then like I said, 
Now, if you only made six bikes, what percent of bikes were completed, right? So the theoretical yield, I'll just call it TY, was seven, and that was based on the limiting reactant. That's from the earlier slide. The actual yield is actually what you get out of the reaction. Like in an experiment, it's what you weigh out, okay? Like when you did the copper cycle reaction, it's what we call the, uh, the qualitative observations lab, as known as the copper cycle. The copper you weighed at the end, that was your actual yield, okay? So the actual yield is what actually gets made. And then the percent yield is going to be this. It's going to be the actual over the theoretical. times 100. So in this case, it'll be 6 over 7 times 100. It's like 85, 85.1? 85.71. Okay. And bikes are kind of exact, so how many sick face you want to put on there? Okay, so we'll practice it with this. Wait, I can leave that up there for a second longer. So recognize in all of these problems, uh, you're going to have to write the reaction. That's what we've been working on last week, right? The reactions, right? The reactions, the products. Now it says if three moles of magnesium nitride react with 15 moles of water. How many moles of magnesium hydroxide can you form? Okay. So one of those is the frames, one of those is the wheels, right? And it's not a one to two ratio, it's a one and six ratio. See that? But it's the same concept. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate and then how much how many moles of MgOH3 can be formed. We're looking for moles of MgOH2. And you're given, normally I'd write all that stacked up, but I'm gonna need a lot of space, I think. The given, it's three moles of M, G, three, and two, and 15 moles of H2O. So now, we have to calculate how much magnesium hydroxide gets produced by each of those. So it's actually two separate calculations and a comparison, okay? So moles of MgOH2, I'll start with three moles of Mg3N2. And then it's my mole ratio for magnesium hydroxide. So what's the mole ratio that I would use from the equation? How many moles of magnesium hydroxide can you produce on the right hand side? Three, right? So it's three moles of magnesium hydroxide. And then in the balanced equation, how many moles of magnesium nitride are? One, right? So that's the ratio I'm going to use. So this comes out to be nine moles. The magnesium nitrides will cancel out of MgOH2. Now I have to do the same calculation, right, for the water. So it's still going to be moles of MgOH2, and I'm going to start with 15 moles of water, and then I have to use a mole ratio. Why don't you fill the mole ratio in, and then I'll write it out, and then we'll look at, our, look at what we get. Scroll down a little bit. What 
mole ratio do you use? So what am, what am I going to have on top? Yep, three mole mg oh two, and on the bottom six mole h two o. Fifteen divided by six is two and a half. Yeah, times three is seven and a half. Seven point five mole. Mg OH2, like that. The moles of water cancel, and that's how much I can make. Let me ask you a question, right? This is that first step. I calculated moles I could make from each of the reactants. How much do I actually get out of the reaction? All right? Nine, seven and a half, or 16.5? Those are all the answers that people will write down, by the way. They'll write down nine, they'll write down seven and a half, they'll write down six and a half. Which is the correct one? What's that? Seven and a half, right? This is, that's the moles of magnesium hydroxide that can be formed. Because once, right, you get to that many moles of magnesium hydroxide, what happened to the water? It ran out, it went away. It got all put into the product now, right? So my limiting reactant is what? Is the water. This is the limiting reactant. Well, actually, the H2O is not the whole thing. But. What's my excess reactant then? The magnesium nitrate, Mg3N2, like that. Okay. Okay, you guys do this one. Now there's a little twist here. We want to know how many grams of carbon monoxide could be formed. So you'll figure out moles of carbon monoxide, and then you'll figure out grams. Okay, so we're trying to figure out CO. And we'll do the, I'll have you guys do the limiting reactant part first, and then we'll just convert it to grams. And if you have questions, let me know, and I'll come by and I'll help you set it up. Sorry, this is all the new stuff. Let's see what's happening. Kind of nice having the slide to write on, huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it must be lost in my note. My bag. So I'm going to write out stuff up here, but I'm going to say I'm looking for moles of CO.
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is four. Which one did you use? Four, four of these to one of those. Four of these to four of those, yeah. Oh, well, what do you want for cancer? You, know, you, want, the, you want to be left with cancer. Because right. this is moles here. That's what I'm But the 28 doesn't matter about the number. No, the number goes with the grams. Okay. There you go. Okay, so let me, uh, let's write this out. So it's how, what do I want to put um, on top of the line? What's going to be up here? It's going to be moles of something, right? The moles of CO. And the number that goes with that? Four. All right, so this number goes there. And on the bottom, I need to cancel Na2SO4, so it's one mole Na2SO4. If I do that calculation, I'll get a number. And I'll just do it on my phone. So it'll be 4 times 0.455, that's 1.82 moles of CO. And then for the carbon, what goes on top? Four moles. Four moles of CO. It's the exact same thing. When you do these limiting reacting problems, it's going to bug some of you that you're writing the exact same thing down. That's the way it's supposed to be. You're trying to figure it out for the same product. Okay. So this will be four moles of CO, but on the bottom is four moles of C, and so I get 0 0.943 moles of CO. So how many, what's my uh, theoretical yield in moles? Yeah, it's the bottom one, right? Because that's the smaller number. So this is how many, how many moles of CO I can produce, and now we can convert that into grams now that we know. Okay. Um, which one's the uh, theoretical yield? So the grams of CO are going to be 0 0.943 moles of CO. And then, right, carbon monoxide's molar mass is 28.010 grams per mole. So I want the moles of CO at the bottom. And then at the top, I want grams. And that's going to, the number will go along with that grams part. Yeah, let me, let me uh, finish this and I'll do that. Quick. And this comes out 26.4 grams. It's not that I don't trust you, I still can't hear out of my ear. So, <laughs> just like she said, numbers. That's the excuse I've been using with my wife. I don't hear you at all. Okay, so the question was why didn't we use the 1.82? Somebody want to tell me? Then we run out of CO, so you cannot make one point three. Yeah. So when you, so think about it like this: as this reaction is going, right? I have this reaction that's up here. Four carbons get used, one sodium sulfate is used. Four carbons get used, one sodium sulfate is used. So I start with 0.455 moles of sodium sulfate, and I start with 0.943 moles of carbon, right? Every time some carbon gets used, sodium sulfate gets used. Eventually, the carbon runs out and gets com completely converted over to carbon monoxide. When it runs out, the reaction has to stop. Because you don't have any more carbon, right? So the carbon runs out, and the reaction stops before all the product could get made that the sodium sulfate says could get made. So which one's my limiting reactant? Yeah, it's the carbon, right? Excess reactant. Yeah, this is so. This is my limiting. This is my excess, which is my theoretical yield. Yeah, these are both the theoretical yield, just in different units. One's in grams, one's in moles. 
But typically, we, you have to calculate it in moles first. There's not really a good way to bypass moles. Another problem too. Yeah. Okay, we'll do this problem. I'll have you guys work on this one as well. But I'll help you out a little bit. It says seven and a half grams of sodium sulfide were produced. How many grams of carbon were used? I'm gonna give you the molar masses. What's the molar masses? So let's write out what we have. All right. I have 7.5 grams of Na2S, and it's asking for grams of carbon. And then some molar masses are given, right? So before you can use the coefficients, the one, the four, the one, and the four that are up here, before you can do that, everything has to be moles. So if you get grams, you should automatically think I have to convert to moles. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to have grams of sodium sulfide. You're going to go to moles of sodium sulfide. You're going to go to moles of carbon. And then you'll go to grams of carbon. And this pattern Grams to moles to moles to gram get done over and over and over again. So you just might as well get used to it. If you have grams, you probably need moles and you probably need a molar mass. Like when you're doing your homework, you used to calculate molar mass after that. Hopefully, you know, you guys are getting out there. So we're looking for grams of carbon. And we're going to start with grams of sodium sulfide. And then go ahead and you guys set up the rest of the problem and then I'll write it out. But how are you going to go from grams of sodium sulfide to moles of sodium sulfide from the mole to mole? Yeah. Yeah. 
stuff, right? So what this says is this stuff, like this, can only make that much. Well, oh, that's just the rate. But these are both. These are both theoretically equal quantities. Like this many moles is the same. You can always use a smaller one. Because the, small, the smaller one, um, when, when you get to that amount, that reactant runs out, and so you can't make any more. Okay. All right. Uh, let me write it out. See what you got. You should get four point six, like the little number says in the corner. I need to make those smaller. So it's um, sodium sulfide. So it's seventy eight point zero four eight grams for every one mole of Na two S. And then what do I do? Because the grams will cancel. So now what do I need to be canceling? Mole. Moles. So I have one mole of Na2S and four, four right, moles of carbon. And now what do I do? One mole of carbon. 12.01. One grams, and it should come out to four point six one. Did it? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, what was the twenty eight point oh one oh for? Just extra information that you didn't need. Yeah, but I think it was given in some of the earlier problems, right? So a lot of times in these problems, you'll have a series of problems are all the same, but they give you all the same information. You don't have to use all the information in the problem. You knew you needed grams of carbon. So you just look it up on the periodic table. So that comes out to four point. I got six two when I rounded. Oh, sorry, seven five zero. Okay, have fun with this one. Okay, so uh, it says four grams of calcium carbonate are mixed with 3.5 grams of hydrochloric acid. And then it says carbon dioxide and calcium chlorides are the products. Calculate the volume in liters of carbon dioxide gas that could be produced. And that says CO2 gas has a density of 1.2 grams per liter. In order to do all these problems, you need a balanced equation. So first thing you should think about is balancing the equation. And then after that, you have to figure out what kind of problem it is. And it could sometimes be just a straight gram to mole to mole to gram conversion, or sometimes it's a limiting reactant problem. How do you know if it's a limiting reactant problem? No. Nope. How do you know it's a limiting reactant problem? <laughs> it's kind of obvious it's kind of not obvious when I tell you it'll be yeah, of course that's what I mean. if I gave you two reactants it's a limiting reactant because one of them is going to run out anytime I give you two reactants or more sometimes it's three or four anytime I give you more than one quantity to start with it's got to be a limiting reactant because one of them's got to run out before the others. Okay, so if you look at this problem, it says you have four grams of calcium carbonate, right, and three and a half grams of hydrochloric acid, and you mix them together. Even though I don't have the chemical reaction written out yet, those are the reactants. It's a limiting reactant. Okay. So two or more reactants. equals limiting reactant. And then if it is a limiting reactant problem, then you have to calculate the moles or the mass of the product that forms from each reactant, or each reactant. Okay, so I wrote a balanced equation. Right? So that's 
what it looks like. Which actually, you'll learn how to predict this. <coughs> and then I already set it up. I have the grams of calcium carbonate, and I want to know how much um, carbon dioxide gas gets produced. Okay. So grams of product from calcium carbonate. I'm starting with this many grams of calcium carbonate and grams of product formed from HCl and I'm starting with this much HCl. So for each one of those you have to convert it over to grams of carbon dioxide. And all, all the information actually is given on this previous slide here. Right? So I'm going to have, I'll write out the pathway up here. It's grams of CaCO3. I'm going to go to, what do I go to from grams? I can hear you guys fine. I can't hear the other people. Starting with gram, what's the first thing I want to figure out? Oh, yeah. So you need a molar mass, right? So I'm going to go moles of CaCO3. And what am I trying to convert that into? Like you have a slide in front of you that says slides up on the screen. What, what is it asking to find? CO. Uh, CO2, yeah, CO2. So I'm trying to go to moles of CO2 then. And then once I have moles of CO2, I'm going to go to grams of CO2. And that, those molar masses are on the slide. Is that? Yeah, and then the last step, the last step will be taking... Um, the liters, right? Get the grams and converting it to liters. But the first thing you want to do is figure out like what the limiting reactant is, and what my theoretical yield is in grams. So take a little time and set that up. I'll start you out by writing out at least this much. If you're having trouble filling it in, let me know and I'll, I'll point out to you. So, here, first thing you want to do is see I wrote out grams of mole. It's that same pattern here. I want to get the mole. This is the mole.
I know it's, it's tempting to ground it, but try not yeah. to. Okay, so let me write this out. So it's 100.09, I think, grams for every one mole of CaCO3. And then my mole ratio is one and one, right? It's one mole of C for every one mole of CO2. And then it's 44.0 what? Zero nine? No, zero, zero, zero nine grams for every one. And that, that should give you, I think, the 1.75. Um, three sig figs, but we'll carry we'll we will carry those digits and we'll round at the end. For the HCL, it's the same kind of thing, right? Yes. You're gonna have times it's going to be grams of HCl for every one mole of HCl. It will be two moles of HCl for the balanced equation for every one mole of CO2. And then it will be 44.009 grams for every one mole of CO2. And that will give me the, oh, by the way, what's the grams for the HCl? And then that'll give me 2.1123 grams of CO2. So my limiting, uh, going over here, what's the theoretical yield? Yeah, 1.7588. Um, if it's asking you for the number at this point, then you say 1.76 grams. Because you round it when they ask for the answer, that's you're rounding it. But when you use it in the calculation, you don't round it. And the limiting reactant, CaCO2. That's what runs out and gives you that. So that last bit is to convert to liters. So I want the volume. So I'm going to 1.76 grams times. And then my density is given. And the density is 1.20 grams per liter. So I put 1.20 at the bottom. And liters goes at the top. And that'll give you 1.47 liters. And actually, this should be 5, 8, 8, like that. I think that's what it was. So, 5, 8, 8, yeah. And then you'll round it to 1.47. Honestly, I don't know why I did this on the next slide. I just scrolled down and looked at it, and it said if the CO2 theoretical yield was 1.46 liters, it's 1.47. I spent all that time getting to 1.47. I didn't use it, and I don't know why.
and 524 milliliters is produced, right? Calculate the percent yield. So my theoretical yield is this. This is what you would spend all your time mostly calculating. So my percent yield is my actual over my theoretical, right? This is the equation that's down here. Theoretical in this case would be 1.46 liters. Here's the problem with the actual, the units are wrong. So if I actually did this, right, and wrote it out as um, 524 milliliters, those units don't cancel properly. So when you do theoretical yields, make sure you have it in the same unit, otherwise you won't get the right answer. So this, right, doesn't work. So the first thing you're going to have to do in this problem is get it in the same units. And I'm just going to save a little time and say it's 0 0.524 liters divided by 1.46 liters times 100. And that will give you 35.8%. So you need to convert. Generally speaking, when you calculate it, it's in the same units, but occasionally you run into situations like this. Okay, so let's see. What do I have left here? Oh, yeah, three example reactions. So we, um, I think I only have three slides, not four. So you're going to have to know these reactions, and some of these you just memorize. Okay, so you're going to have to know how to memorize. So there's a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions are really easy, right? For hydrocarbons, like CH and O, Right. It reacts with oxygen, O2, produces carbon dioxide and water. It's always the products of the oxidation reaction, or the re a combustion reaction. So let's go through these one at a time. We'll come back to these. So that bottom one is a hydrocarbon problem, right? Reacts with oxygen, right, and produces carbon dioxide and water. So we're going to write CO2 and water. Technically speaking, CO2 is, the is an oxide of carbon. And the actual definition of a combustion reaction is that it's something that reacts with oxygen to produce an oxide of carbon. So it turns out you can have a combustion reaction of metals too, like sodium or magnesium. These things will all burn with your oxygen and produce heat and light, just like you'd expect to see when you burn uh, like methane or, uh, methane or propane or butane and light. You get heat and light. In those instances, the oxide is always carbon dioxide. You get water out. When you de deal with non-carbon reactants, generally metals, you get the oxide of whatever the metal is. So how do you know what the oxide for sodium is? Well, it's going to be sodium oxide, so you have to write the formula. So sodium oxide, you can write it in words. What's sodium ion? What's its charge? Plus one, right? So it's sodium plus, and what's oxide? O2 minus, right? Like that. 
And so the formula of the oxide that gets produced is Na2O, like that. So if you want to balance this, right, just for fun, I'll give you the numbers. It's 2 and 4, like that. And that, that's balanced out. But the trick is to write the oxide, right? You just say you say the name of it, and then you write the formula. For the name. So if I took magnesium, what's the product going to be? Magnesium oxide. Then you write the formula. Iron. If I wrote said iron, the iron oxide. Now iron's trickier. You have to know which one, but it's usually plus three. You have to know some extra chemistry on that. But yeah, you just say it, and then you write it out. Hydrocarbons are weird because you get another product, you get water out too. Right. Okay, so in the, how would you balance this one? I need two here, right? I'm going to start with this. I have one carbon. I have four hydrogens now. And so my oxygens is the only thing I have left to balance. So I have two from here, and I have two from here. So I need a total of four. So I'll pop a two in there. And that'll give me my four. My balanced. This is the oxygen. Okay. So that's combustion reactions in a nutshell. So alkali uh, metal reactions. It's kind of weird. They never like had these before. So they give you these three in the book. They give you these three reactions. And they have a whole other chapter on the guy just to introduce you to the idea of writing. But an alkali metal reaction. <clears throat> so you with a halogen. So the halogens are the Cl2s, the Br2s, and the I2s. Well, and we can have F2. I left F2 out. I mean, we put that in the front, F2. Same trick, right? Let's say bromine. I'm reacting it with magnesium. It's called it be the bromide and magnesium, so magnesium bromine. Right? So you just write it out. If it's sodium and chlorine, the reactants will produce sodium chloride. And then you write it out. You write out the, in your head or on paper, you write out the, the name of the compound. This is not the why it forms it, by the way. This is just how you know what it forms. Just say the compound and then write the formula. All right. this, the why we learn uh, later. That's sodium ion, that's chloride ion, so you'll have NaCl. And like I said, if it would have been magnesium or strontium or aluminum, you would just said aluminum chloride, written the formula. Strontium chloride, this is usually plus two. Right. Or it's plus two, sorry, you write the formula. So, sodium chloride is like that. So to balance this, I'll need a, it needs a two here and a two here. But like I said, if it, if I had said instead strontium SR and Br2, which is kind of a violent reaction, SR is strontium. I would write out strontium bromide. makes an ionic compound. And then strontium, I have to look up. Come on the periodic table, it's in group two, so it must be a two plus, and bromide is minus one, so my formula is SRBR2, like that. And that's already balanced. General. So alkali metals are group one. Okay. In general, will produce hydroxides and hydrogen gas. Okay. So you end up with 
lithium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Those are the two products. But again, if you know it's going to be the hydroxide, you just take the name and you write the formula from it. So lithium is Li plus, hydroxide is OH minus, so my formula is just LiOH. Again, you'd have to go balance it. I think this one's already balanced. No, it's not. I'll need a two here. And a two here, I think. No, that doesn't do it, does it? I need two waters for that. There'll be a two here. There we go. That was truly balancing by inspection, by the way, guys. I didn't um, try to do anything fancy. I just started making numbers match. So that's what I, all I do if I do anything fancy. Brute force. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so, you know. Yeah, and the other thing you, you need to know, which is, I'm not sure uh, why we're doing it now. It actually comes out later. The further down you go in the periodic table of the alkaline metal, the more reactive, the more violent the reactive. So, like, lithium hydroxide, that reaction is really slow. You throw the water, kind of bubbles along. Uh, sodium, when you put it in water, it burns yellow and you get hydrogen gas and that catches on fire. When you put potassium, rubidium, and cesium in water, at some point they explode. And it's, it's interesting that the reason for the explosion was only understood about five or six years ago. And the, even though we've been doing this demo for like hundreds of years, just throwing sodium in water and watching it explode, um, I'll, I'm going to do it in between the uh, in between the gla uh, class uh, chapter four and five. But, but uh, yeah, we've been doing this thing for a hundred, maybe more years, as long as we've been able to make sodium. We've been throwing it in water and watching it react. Uh, it was only recently they discovered like why the explosion actually takes place. And so I'll talk about that when we actually do it over. You can see it, and then it's going to explode. And this summer, I was kind of mean, and I didn't tell the students it was going to explode. And I videotaped it. <laughs> and all the students went, ah! Oh! And this one girl, I didn't realize she was going to have such a violent reaction. So I, I had to stop doing that. But. So we'll do it at the break. All right. So yeah, the, the halogens at the bottom are even more violent, uh, and sodium will actually explode at some point if you give it time. And we'll, we'll get to see that hopefully if it actually happens. Now, yeah, if you take metals with halogens, we saw what that does, but if you react halogen with other halogens, you just get interhalogen compounds. So yeah, B, R or IBR would be it. So you get two of those. I'm not sure what drove me to put AT in there. You know, AT is the very bottom. Um, but that one would be. Uh, well, actually, is it IBR or is it BRI? More electronegative goes second. Yeah, that's right. So then this would be A T I. And I didn't write a I don't I don't actually know what that formula is. There's so little of it and so little known about it, they assume it's diatomic, but we don't know for sure. The estimate is there's like milligrams of the earth at the time at a time. And it's all formal. Yeah, so I'm with the I in the front. Um Whichever one's on top goes first. That's what we'll do for now. It has to do with something called electronegativity. Most electronegative elements go to, to the end, and the least electronegative go in the front. So if you had 3A, you remember electronegativity trends? That's generally how it is. 
Yeah, I think electronegativity increases if you go from the bottom to the left to the top right. But uh, most of the time, I don't care that you know the order. There's actually an official order, like which way you're supposed to take them out there if you know that. But if you're going to guess, that's what I had to do. I'm like, oh, uh, which one's which? And then I just put them in order. All right, so let's take a break. I'm going to go set that demo up. So what we were just looking at is what you couldn't see happen is the chunk of sodium, you know, it was, it was, it was sort of rectangular, so it was kind of like this. And then, uh, and then it went into the water, and it actually gets so hot, there's a lot of heat that's generated from this reaction. It forms molten sodium. And then what's happening at the surface is it reacts with water. And then from that comes um, hydrogen gas and then sodium and hydroxide go into the solution. So you have sodium and OH minus. So those are all the things that are happening. Water gets the sodium. So the reaction that we were, we, we had this reaction on the earlier slides. We had sodium plus water make uh, sodium hydroxide plus H2 gas. Let's see, which way did this balance again? I think that's okay, huh? No, no, no. I have to have, I, I have three hydrogens on the right. Yeah. This is a weird one to balance. So let me go ahead and do this, and this, and this, and that's balanced. Okay, so that was the reaction we were looking at. So what, what they believe is happening on the metal is during the course of this reaction, sodium is going to a sodium ion and an electron. That's what's happening. So this is happening on the surface. So what's happening at the surface of the sodium is developing a charge. And then what happens is the charge gets the, the surface area gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So what do all the charges want to do? They, they want to get away from each other because they're all either they're all negative charges, electrons on the surface, and that causes the sodium to rip apart. That's what actually is going on. It's the charge of the of the re that's been generated by the reaction ripping the sodium metal apart. It just happened really fast on this one. Right? But normally you get to see the ball of sodium floating around and it has like the, the, the hydrogen gas burning around. It's kind of fun to watch for a while and then all of a sudden it explodes. Yeah, this one didn't give us any time. So uh, this chapter we're gonna talk about aqueous solutions and aqueous reactions. This whole uh, semester really is aqueous reactions. And um, there's some terms that we have to get oh, get through, okay? Um, but I just wanted to define some stuff for you. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. That's from uh, chapter one, I think. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. There's two components at the least for every solution. There's whatever you have the most of, and that's usually what we call the solvent. It's the thing that does the dissolving. And there's a thing that you usually have less of, and that's known as the solute. So if I take, for example, salt and I put it in water, right? water would be the solvent, it would dissolve, sodium chloride would be the solute, and then what results would be the solution. When water is the solvent, we refer to these as aqueous solutions, and that gives us that AQ term that you'll see a lot of, that's an A, AQ term that we'll see as a state a lot in this chapter. We do lots, it's all aqueous reactions. Um, let's see. Yeah. So uh, we're going to deal with quantitative uh, terms, but there are some qualitative terms which I know you guys might be okay with, but they always leave me a little uneasy. We have dilute solutions that we have concentrated. What does that sound like? What's concentrated sound like? More, More right? So you, if you go to the store, right, and you buy Dawn, concentrated, how did they concentrate it? Less water. They just put less water in it. 
right? Less solvent, more solute means more concentration. And so concentrated solutions generally have large amounts of solute. If it's Dawn, it's the soap molecule. Um, it's a medication, it's the medic whatever the medication is. It's not more solute uh, compared to the solvent. Dilute solutions have less. So it's very easy to take a concentrated solution and make a dilute solution from it just by adding water to it. And typically in a laboratory, we have pure solids, and they're a little bit inconvenient to deal with. Because when you want to make a solution, you have to weigh it out, solve it. Sometimes it can take a day, sometimes it goes really fast, sometimes it can take a long time. And so typically what we'll do in a laboratory is we'll take those solids and we'll make concentrated solutions out of them. Those concentrated solutions is what we are what we use to make all the other solutions that you guys use in class. Okay. Give you an example: sulfuric acid has the, the pure when you buy it, like from the chemistry store, a chemical company. It's 18 molar, which means it has 18 moles of sulfuric acid per liter. It's basically all sulfuric acid, very little water. If you take that and you put it in water. It gets so hot that the water generally will boil. So if you took a cup or a, sorry, a liter of sulfuric acid, a liter of water, and you just mix it together, it would boil out of the flask. It generates so much heat. So what we typically do with sulfuric acid is we do that part and we do it really slowly with ice water so it doesn't boil. And then we just store it on the shelf as nine molar half a cup. So the 18 molar would be the concentrated solution, the nine molar would be the dilute, dilute solution. For us, the dilute solution is roughly the same concentration as the battery acid in the car. So it doesn't mean like, oh, that's a safe amount. It's just less than the pure solution, okay? If that makes sense. Any of you ever get battery acid on you? Nobody? You have. How's it feel? It burns, yeah. So the 18 molar is twice as strong, but still it's like dilute. For us, that's a dilute solution, okay? It's just not super concentrated. The other thing that's concentrated, uh, the solutions, right? And dilute solutions will often prepare, like I was saying, we take this and we dilute it down. And that's what we use to make a stock solution. And the stock solution is what we make everything else out of. Okay, and that, that's stuff that's on later slides as well. Now quantitatively, and this is where I, I feel more comfortable, uh, is being able to tell you how much there is. We use this uh, unit called molarity. And the molarity is the moles of the solute in the liters of the solution. Okay, so if I have a nine molar solution, which is typically what we use as our diluted for our stock solution. Um, that has nine moles of sulfuric acid in it. For every one liter of the solution. And you have to remember when I say solution, all right? That's both the solute plus the solvent. I'm going to grab some things so you can actually see it. There's a picture of it on the next slide. Right here. dollars of glass. So don't let me drop it. Yeah, I didn't ask permission. This is a five liter volumetric glass. How many lines do you see on there? One. That's all it's for is five liters. If you wanted four, you can't use it. If you wanted six, you can't use it. What five is the one? <laughs> so this is what we would make a stock solution in. We would say, I want five liters of a certain molarity, right? 
let's say it's uh, one molar sodium chloride, but I want five liters of it, right? How many moles would have to be in here? Well, I would need five because there's five liters. And that would be one mole per liter. So I put the sodium chloride in here, right? the five mole sodium chloride. To do that, I actually weigh it out. Like sodium is 22.99 and then uh, chlorine is 35.45. I add those together, right? I take that mass, multiply it by five, I weigh it out, I dump it all in there, and most of it in there, and I fill it up about halfway with water, and I do this. Why do I do this? Because I want to mix it, right? If I mix it, if it gets hot, I'll run cold water over it, and so it's like. Because here's the deal on the volume of the glass, once you fill it up to here, there's no easy mix. There's no sloshing in this at all. And so the only way you can mix it is go like this. I mean, it's really dangerous. Nobody wants to do this for a long time, right? The other thing that we can do is we can put a magnetic stirrer in here. So once you get the volume correct, you throw a magnetic stirrer in and get stir. But oftentimes, this is important, that the volume will change. The density of the solution changes, the volume changes. You have to be a little bit careful. But this is a volumetric flask. It's what we, and they're not all this big, but this is for stock solutions. Most of them are smaller, like the ones you can use in class, you'll use a 100 mil and a 50 mil. Those are all much smaller, reasonable things. This is how we get that exact volume. Though. We put stuff in here and we fill it to halfway, we dissolve it, and then we fill it up to this thing, it's called the mark, because it's the only mark on the glass. Right? It's kind of cool, the way they make these actually. They make them, and then they fill them on a really precise, balance and then when they get exactly the correct amount of mass in there for five liters they score this that's what this line is actually scratched into the glass on the outside and they do it at 25 degrees Celsius take a little piece of glass and they'll blow it up into a ball and they'll fill it up on a balance and then they'll score it and they'll make, they'll make their own. So do they all like have a place, like if you line them all up, do they all have different places? Yeah, the line is always, like if you took, if I, I don't have, we only have one of those. If I had like 10 of them and you lined them all up, that line would be all in different places because it was all put on after they made the glass and filled it up. Yeah. I don't know, I just think it's cool. So let's say you want to make a one molar solution. I just wanted you to see it before I showed you the picture. One molarity of X would weigh out the substance, one mole of the substance. So if you do the molar mass, let's say the molar mass was 58, and you weigh out 58 grams. You add it to the flask and you fill it to the mark. Assuming this is a one liter container, that would make a one molar solution. Now, this is just to point out some stupid things you see in textbooks. What is he pouring out of? And I X out. What's it look like? Graduated cylinder. You would never do that. You would take a weighing something. There's actually you just don't because all this the stuff will get stuck in there. We have you could do it in a beaker and then you could rinse it out easy, but graduating cylinder, I don't know why they did that. And then we use a powder funnel to get it transferred in. We dissolve it partially. This is going part way in dissolving it, and then we fill it up to the mark, the one liter mark. And that would give you a one molar solution. So what is the plastic um, I would usually, they actually make things called weighing boats that are big plastic things. I would get the appropriate size one and a weigh it into the weighing boat, and then you pour it out of the weighing boat through a powder funnel into the flask. And then that's a big open thing. You can rinse it off real easy. But I don't. Nobody uses a graduated cylinder. <laughs> Beaker maybe. Gradu. I don't know. Okay. So let's say you wanted to make three liters of a two molar solution. Right, how many moles of solute do you need? 
the way you calculate it. Well, let's do it conceptually, actually. This one's pretty easy. How many moles are there in each liter? No, no, it says you want three liters of a two molar solution. How many moles? There's two moles, right? How many liters are there? So six, right? You see, need six moles of substance because it's two moles per liter, and you have three liters, so it'll be six moles that you need to make, okay? The math goes like this. Whenever you see this, write this, moles, solute per liter. And that tells you what, how you use that number, okay? So if I have 3.0 liters, and I'm looking for moles of solute, what needs to be on top and what needs to be on bottom? Yep, mole on top, liters at bottom. What goes with the mole and what goes with the liter? Two, because that's the number in front, right? Yeah, yeah. so 2.0 and then one, that's per liter, so it's one, right? And that gives you the mole, so this is equal to 6.0 moles, because the liters will cancel, just like that. So molarity gets to be used as a conversion factor all the time. We use it in class all the time. So if I'm going to use, let's say I have a two molar solution just for fun. Right, that's its equivalence of two moles per liter, like that. If I want to go from liters to moles, just like we did now, it's two moles per liter, like that. But what if I want to go from moles to liters? I have to have liters on the top. It'll be one liter, if it bugs you not to have anything there, right? Sometimes it does. And then on the bottom, it'll be two moles. Because what your goal is to cancel out the unit you're starting with and be left with whatever the other unit is. So it says, what volume of 1.25 molar glucose solution do you, would you need to get 1.75 moles of glucose? So again, what's M? Moles over liters, right? And what am I starting with? And what am I looking for? Yeah, I'm looking for volume, which will be liters. And this is my moles. That's my given, right? So identify the things you're given and what you're looking for. So I'll start with 1.75. What goes on top? What goes on bottom? Yeah, one liter on top and then 0 0.125 moles at the bottom. And then you end up with 14.0. That's what I have on the slide, I don't know. 14, yeah. What'd you get? You got something different? Do it again. Oh, because I put there, right? Never mind. Got me all worried. So the moles will cancel out and leave you with okay? All right, you practice these ones. And I started you out here. It says, a solution is prepared by adding 1.38 grams of calcium chloride to a 250 milliliter volumetric flask, right? And filling the flask to the mark. Calculate the calcium chloride Molarity. So when you're doing molarity, it's solute over solvent. So what I did is I put the solute, the 1.348, at the top. At the bottom, I put the, the solution. Sorry, it's the solution. So solute over solution. This is what you need to do, and I'm going to let you guys try to work on this. You're going to need it to convert in two steps. Grams needs to be converted over to moles. And then the milliliters needs to be converted over to liters. So there's two steps to the conversion. So I'll let you choose how you do it. But there will be two things that go in there. Well, I gave you the ball of math. Don't touch 
possible that you would have by the way it's concentrated sodium in water. That would be You want you guys want to see how I did it? Just a check. So I want to get rid of grams, and it's 110.98 grams at the bottom, and one mole at the top. Remember, my goal for molarity is I want solute in moles and solution in liters. So if I do that, if I do this part of the conversion, I have moles per milliliter right now, right? So then I have to convert the milliliter unit to liter units. So however you want to do it, you could say 1,000 milliliters in a liter if that's what you grew up knowing, or you could just do it like we did. I want to get rid of milliliters. So the prefix was with one, right, half, and the other half is the number, like that. Bless you. So then what will happen is the liters will cancel. Sorry, not the liters will cancel. The milliliters will cancel. And what are my units that are left? I have moles and I have liter. So when you're calculating a molarity, solute, solve it, and then convert it over. Okay. Now, if you took 3A and you learned, there's like different ways to do this. Right? You can calculate the moles and convert the milliliters to liter and divide. It's still, you'll get the same answer. Okay? So you want to I want you guys to learn how to do everything like that, including breathe. Oh. Yeah. yeah, so if you do that, oops, you should get 0 0.04858. Five, three, blah, 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 moles per liter. And then you look at sig figs and you should have four. Well, that's to here. And so I would write 4.859 times 10 to the minus two molar. Now, if you're gonna use this in another calculation, then you don't round, but you just mark it. Like here, I just marked the number at the bottom of the slide. Oh, I feel like I've done enough lecture for today. So we'll take now we'll take the 15 minute break. And um, I'm gonna get a soda to get the lab set up. Lab coats, goggles, I'm gonna check to see who did the quiz. Did everybody do the quiz? Yeah. Everybody? Nobody? You forgot. You could still do it. I'll let you. Wasn't that bad? I'm gonna. Did you like having like the study questions? Yes. 
Yeah. I'm going to try to do that for every single one. I thought that was kind of cruel on the first one, like, timed quiz, no hint as to what the question was, but I just want to see how it went, and I decided, I'll, I'll do steady questions. I was nice about it. All right.